Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 14th of July and some big announcements this week. As always, I have the chapters, so you can jump to the update you care about the most. And based on some of those announcements this week, so my first new video this week was Azure AD renamed. So yes, it has been renamed to Microsoft Entra ID, but it's not changing functionality, it's just a rename of that feature. And I, I kind of go through that in that very quick video. There's been a huge amount of response, um, some of it very negative. And rather than address it here, I think I'll just create a response video to try and address some of the concerns because some of them are based on misunderstandings of what Azure AD actually is, um, what you should be doing with the PowerShell module. So some of the most negative reactions I saw because people didn't understand what Azure AD really was, which really encourages that it should have been renamed and people are like, oh, the Azure AD module, well, that's been deprecated anyway. So I wanna go through some of those things. So I'll do a video diving into that, but I go through the basics, but again, it's not a functionality change. It's just a rename to Microsoft Entra ID. And then I try to do a, a bigger video just talking about how I can think leveraging all the different aspects, protecting my applications, be they in the cloud, be they applications that I create, maybe they're on premises, using the different aspects of Microsoft Entry, like the conditional access, the identity protection, and the app proxy, bringing all of that together. On to what's new. So on the compute side, we now have a preview of the V2 of the B series. Now remember, B was burstable. The idea is, rather than me just being a provisioned 100% of the virtual CPUs that the VM sees, maybe I'm provisioned 20% of each of those virtual CPUs. So I pay less money, and if I use less than the provisioned amount, kind of like accruing credit, I can actually burst beyond that 20% for a period of time. So if I had fairly bursty workloads that ordinarily don't need a lot of CPU, but occasionally do, the B series is very attractive for that. And what they've done is with the V2, it's sort of five times the network bandwidth. We get accelerated network support, which is great. There's 10 times the storage throughput. And we have the regular BS, which means the, the S means it can use premium storage. And once again, you can see the idea here of the base CPU performance that we get. And there are some variations, but we can see there's kind of tiny amount of memory, a low amount of memory, and just regular memory. And you can see that corresponding here, depending on what my workloads are. But you'll also see there's an A series based on AMD. And there's also a P series based on ARM using the Ampere Ultra processors. So there's different versions of them, but all of them are based around that burstable idea that if in a normal ongoing basis, I don't require all of the provision CPU, maybe I just need 20%, but then if I use less than that, I can accrue credit and burst up to a higher amount in the future. So that might be very attractive for certain types of workloads. And then Azure Dedicated Host now has a resize capability in preview. Remember, Azure Dedicated Host is the idea where ordinarily we create a VM and that VM goes to a host somewhere in the Azure fabric with other customers. And that's fine, the hypervisor isolates it but maybe I've got certain requirements where I cannot share physical hardware with another workload, maybe regulatory requirements. So Azure Dedicated Host lets me purchase the entire capacity of a host. Now that host is a certain type. It supports D series or E series or whatever that is. And then I can fill it up with VMs of that corresponding family of different sizes until I've used all of that size. Now as Microsoft Hardware Advances, there are newer generations of the underlying box. So what this resize now lets me do is I can resize within the same family to a newer type. So I could have gone from a DSV3 type one to a DSV3 type four, for example. Now I can't move between type series, so I couldn't move from a D to an E, for example, and I can only resize to a newer one but it's really gonna minimize the effort. I can say, hey, I wanna to move to this new size. There is gonna be some downtime because it's at the underlying fabric gonna create a new host of the new type, move the VMs over, so there'll be some downtime during that move. 
then it will go and delete the old one. But I do have that ability to have a simpler process resize to adopt a newer SKU of host. On the networking side, so the cross-region load balancer has gone GA. We're used to the idea of the regional standard load balancer, that layer four understands TCP, UDP, and I have a bunch of targets on the back end and it, it distributes that workload. So what the cross-region, i.e. the global load balancer does, now it has to be a public endpoint. So it's an any cast static public endpoint. So it's served from all of the different points of presence on the Microsoft Edge network throughout the world, single IP, any cast. When I'm trying to talk to it, I'll talk to whichever edge is closest to me, and then it will redirect me to a regional standard load balancer that is closest to that edge point, so I get the lowest possible latency. Now, if that's not available, it will send it to the next closest one. So the backend sets are regional load balancers that have to have public endpoints. So all of this is about external. This has an external endpoint. Its backend set members have public external endpoints as well. So this is not an internal solution. It's not supporting internal load balancers or private internal load balancers. It's all about those external connectivities. And it has the health probes every 20 seconds. And then express route private peering support for BGP communities. So this is the idea that I can now define a custom BGP community on my virtual network that's connected to my express route circuit. And why that is useful is now when I receive the traffic on my network, well, those values I set will have that regional and custom community value on the traffic being sent from that VNet. So then maybe I have certain preferences or filtering on my side to do something with those values. On the storage side, so Azure Managed Luster has gone GA. So Luster is a managed file system. Now it is designed specifically for high performance computing, for AI workloads. It's an open source parallel file system. So what that means is we can have massive storage sizes that would exceed anything I could normally do on a single box. The whole point is I can have n number of object storage servers. I have some other components handling metadata. I have special Luster client code running on my consuming cluster, but then I can get this huge amount of throughput and performance using this solution. And with the Azure Managed Luster file system, it's on the back end using durable premium SSDs, but it's gonna fully integrate with services like Azure High Performance Computing, uh, with Azure Kubernetes Service, with the Azure Machine Learning. So it's a new option we have available where I want that really huge scalability file system. On the database side, so Azure SQL Database has some new SKUs in GA. It's really a new 128V core option um, for the standard series hardware. And also what they have is for Azure SQL Database and Azure SQL Database Hyperscale, they have this feedback persistence. Now this is all about the idea that a query executes with a certain memory grant. Now if it's too small or too large, it causes problems. If it's too large, it's gonna inhibit parallelism, which is gonna impact my overall performance. If it's too small, then things have to spill out to disk, which is a very costly operation. So what this is gonna do is try and remember the memory needs of prior executions and adjust that grant accordingly to optimize um, how that memory is actually allocated. And then miscellaneous, so yes, Azure Active Directory has been renamed to Microsoft Entra ID. And I've got a whole video going through that. Again, there's not a functionality change, it's just the name of that solution. And then Datadog, the Azure service, has some new features. So it now has multi-subscription monitoring from a single pane of glass. It has some cloud security posture management capabilities. So we can actually track compliance against some of the industry benchmarks available. And I can now also mute the monitoring if there's certain virtual machine plan maintenance. And then finally, Microsoft DevBox has gone GA. So this is this idea of these self-service workstations that can be pre-configured for development type tasks. So it's built on Windows 365 and Intune. So the Intune means I have that centralized management, 
but it is focused on those developer scenarios. But there's a number of different templates based on the specific use case I have. There are many sizes I have available. I can shut it down or hibernate it. And I get predictable pricing because I can pay based on that, uh, I think it's hourly compute usage, but it goes up to a maximum amount. So if I'm using it nearly all the time, there's still a maximum predictable amount uh, that I can work with. And that was it. As always, I hope that was useful. Until next video, take care.